cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart roll away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. It was there. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. God, I praise you so much. You've given so much that oftentimes we can take for granted. And God, as we spoke of in, in our Sunday school class this morning, sometimes we forget the importance of just being in your presence. And God, I know you're here this morning, and I know you're rich, and you're ready to speak to your people, if only we'll listen. So God, I pray that we'll honor you with our ears. And we'll praise you with our hearts. God, I thank you for all you do. We ask this in your name. Amen. I want to join Brother Bill in saying welcome this morning. We want to welcome all of our visitors today and all of you that are visiting with your mother today. It's a very special day. and Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers. Did any of you not get a, a bookmark or Bible mark this morning? The ladies were handing those out. Some of the kids were. The magnets, okay. <laughs> So if you haven't got one of those, somebody will bring you one by. Amen. Our ushers come forward this morning. We're going to go ahead and receive our morning tithes and offerings. We appreciate your support of our church and all that you do for us here. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your presence here this morning and for the opportunity to be in your house. And Father, we pray that you would bless and keep each one this morning. Bless this offering. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So in honor of Mother's Day this morning, <clears throat> I'm going to sing a song that my mom uh, loves and has been asking for for several weeks now and doesn't know I've been holding off to this point to do it. <laughs> so mama, this one's for you.
before we dismiss our kids, Brother Bell's going to come. He's got a special presentation in just a minute. But right before he does that, we're going to make a couple of announcements. Don't forget, you can also, if you miss a service, you can go to our website and, and well, you can watch it live if you're at home, or you can go back and pull one back from out of the archives if you'd like to do that. Great addition to our web page there. And May the 17th, Friday, the youth are having a fundraiser lunch, steak sandwiches by order only, $5 each. See Chuck Brand or any of their youth department, and they'll get you fixed right up. They can deliver to your office maybe for enough of them if you're in town here. And also, May the 19th will be our graduation recognition, and we have a number of graduates this year, and we're proud of those guys. We have two high school graduates and a two or three college graduates, so we're just proud of each of those guys, so we want to recognize them on May the 19th. And also, June 1st, which is a Saturday, and June 2nd, Sunday, uh, revival. Three services. We want you to make plans to be here and enjoy that with us. And may God bless you for that. And if you would, sign our welcome pad before you leave. That's the little black book usually on the on my right, your left of the pew. So if you would do that for us, we'd appreciate that. It helped Brother Bell tremendously during the week. Amen. Glad you're here today. To all you mothers, God bless you. I don't think us men folks want to trade places with you at all. Just came from uh, this past uh, Tuesday, visiting James and Brittany Crafts. Had to labor all night. I told them next morning, you really worked hard for that one, didn't you? She says, yes. So uh, probably if it was left up to our men, our first one might just be our last. I don't know. But thank God for you ladies. We have a, a special thing we do every Mother's Day, and we pick a mother of the day. Now, you have to be here for Sunday school to get your name in here because it's the only way we could do it. So we're going to draw the name out, and we have a mother of the day we'd like to recognize, and I'm going to ask uh, Cheyenne if she'll reach high above your head so you won't pick out your mamas. <laughs> All right. Okay, Miss Faye Hutchins. Miss Faye, we'll just bring it right to you. Or if you want to come sit in a high chair, we'll let you do that. God bless you. Congratulations for our mother of the day, all right? Praise the Lord. Give God praise. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our children right this way right now. So stand up and visit around. Shake somebody's hand. Uh, just tell them you're so glad to see them today at Northside. Got a lot of children back here, so... If you'll just follow this path, and if you're a visitor and you want to know where they're going, it's okay to follow them out and come back in here. It's okay. I want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices, angels above, singing. As one, hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, great I am.
Well, we're glad you're here today. Hopefully I won't be too long. I just want to be long enough, you know. Just uh, the Lord can have his way with us, and I trust that you'll bear with us. I know many of you have plans uh, following the service, but we want God to have his way in here. We're going to be talking this morning about a mother's faith. I think one of the things that uh, is difficult is when our faith is being tried. I want to read a passage of Scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. If you'd like to follow on, I'll put it on the screen. And it's a letter that was written to Timothy. But what is mentioned in here is Timothy's mother and grandmother. So let's take a look at it. He said to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. Now, what is not mentioned in this passage of Scripture is Timothy's father. His father is mentioned in the book of Acts. It just talks about him being a Greek. So that's pretty insignificant, isn't it? You could be an American, or you could be a Jew, or someone else. But the only mention that Paul makes reference to in his letter to Timothy is to his mother and his grandmother. Now, there was something going on in, in Tim, with Timothy. I don't know what it was. <clears throat> But I can promise if something's going on in one of your children, mothers will get to the bottom of it, won't they? I don't know what it was. It's not mentioned. But Paul said I was mindful of Timothy's tears. I don't know what he was crying about. He was a teenager. And some of you mothers may have experienced things with your children. They may have been a teenager. I know when they're small, they, they cry, but, you know, us. Uh, fathers, when our boys get a little older, we just tell them to suck it up, you know. But mothers is a little more tender than that. Uh, they want to know what's wrong. I don't know what it was, but Paul mentioned it. He was crying about something. And just the mention of that touches some of you mothers' hearts. I just know that because that's just the way it is. Because mothers' hearts are tender. And mothers, uh, these particular mothers were mothers of faith. It wasn't just they believed about something. They, it was called unfeigned here in the King James Bible, but it's sincere faith. Sincere faith. It's faith that was genuine in the Lord Jesus Christ that, that pertains to salvation. But it doesn't matter if you're saved. Your faith will be tried. Or if you are saved, rather, your faith will be tested. And I want to talk about some things I... I was uh, reading an article this past week, and, and one feller was uh, referring to when faith is being tested as a monsters to motherhood. And I think sometimes uh, you can relate. And uh, sometimes mothers, because of their duties and what they do and how often they have to do it, they get so busy, tied up and, and taking care of children, that they may seem insignificant. And it depends on how many children you got as to the extent and level of insignificance you may feel. Because the more children you have, the busier you are. I don't know how many children that uh, Timothy's mother had. He may have been the only one, or there may have been others. But it doesn't matter. It's a busy time. And some of you out there, you can, can relate to our culture today, it's somewhat different than it was in times past. Most of us can remember, if you're my age, uh, your mother stayed home, you know, with the kids. It doesn't, doesn't mean they didn't work, by the way. You know, that is a, a, a real deal, isn't it, out there, mothers, if you're a home, home mother. It ain't that you don't work. You got your hands full there. I don't want to swap jobs with you. I'm just being honest. I've tried it. It's tough work. Uh, to watch after children. But nevertheless, uh, it's, it's a real deal. And you stay busy doing things. One of the things that uh, I noticed, and 
it just common. Now, there may be exceptions to this. Some of you guys may be better than I think you are. But, but usually when a spill is made, who's the first one to go get it? It's usually Mama, isn't it? She's the first one there. And uh, sometimes I remember going to a restaurant. We didn't go much when my kids was coming along. We had six, and we just flat couldn't afford it. But, uh, but every now and then, we'd go to the restaurant. One of the things that would concern me, I wonder which one of them is going to turn over their glass today. <laughs> because it just seemed to happen. Uh, it, but, you know, it, that's just a lie. But it, does, it doesn't matter if you're in the restaurant, you're at home. But, but we have to learn to deal with these things. Of course, that's not the only mess they clean up. There's a lot of other messes. And, and uh, if, matter of fact, if you've got children in your house, guess what? There's a mess to be cleaned up. That's just the way it is. It's either you have children and have messes to clean up, or you don't have children, and you're looking for something to do. All right? But sometime in the midst of all of this, some of you feel like, in, in, in taking your children places, you, some of your mothers may feel like you was a taxi driver, you know, just taking them from one thing to another. And like I say, depending on how many you got, how many different places you had to go to, some of you had to drop one off at one place and then drop one off at another and then make the round all over again. I can relate to that. But it's a real deal. You just feel like it, and you can get so tied up into those kind of things, and, and uh, maybe, you know, you don't have time to cook, and you run by Hardy's or McDonald's somewhere, and you're buying some fries, and, and, you know, you feed them in the car. It's just a busy time. Our culture's a little different today. We used to didn't have all of these things we have today. Now we have... You know, we have karate, we have uh, the little t-ball out there, and we have soccer, all kind of things, and sometimes people just go from one to the other. Now, you can't, out, you, you can't overdo those kind of things, and we can't blame nobody but ourselves if we do. However, we do need to bring balance uh, into that, but it's a real deal. Have you ever been in your car and you found a French fry, maybe you was vacuuming it out, and it had been there three months, it looked just like it did when it failed, didn't it? <laughs> Isn't that something? And you're just glad some, one of the little ones didn't find it before you did or they'd eat it, just as sure as you're standing here. It's amazing what goes on in the life of children. Uh, but sometimes uh, you just have a tendency to feel insignificant. But I hope and pray that you won't let that get the best of you. Have you ever been real busy with children and, and maybe you didn't have a vocation and somebody asked you, uh, you know, what are you doing with your life? And you really didn't have what you felt like was a good answer. I don't know if a better one was. I'm just raising up my children. That's a priority in my life. I'm just growing them up and trying to watch after them. But, but sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll lose our sense of purpose and forget the potential of what we're doing. In Deuteronomy... Uh, chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, there's mention of what goes on at the home every day. And, and God said in His Word, He says, He didn't recommend this, He says, I command. I command. This is what I am telling you to do. Now, sometimes when, when you read things like this, and, and even though it's God, some people get offended at that. I don't know why in the world they would. But God knows what's best for us. And He's telling us this and He's commanding us this because it's not optional if we're going to have families and children to grow up and to know the Lord and have the faith that we're talking about here that sometimes we even struggle with ourselves. He said, I want you to, to uh, have my commandments in your heart and you'll teach them diligently to your children and you'll talk about them when you're sitting around at the house and when you're walking around and when you lie down, and when you rise up. That when we're talking about faith, the real genuine thing that's going to take your children uh, on through life and on to heaven, which is where we want them to all to go, then, then we need to talk about this. This needs to be, to be a part of our conversation. But if we're not careful, we'll lose sight of this and get caught up in everything else, and we'll lose our sense of purpose as to why we're here and what we're supposed to be doing and, and the precious things uh, that, that come along with motherhood. <clears throat> Parents have the greatest potential in the world to influence their children more than anybody else. 
Isn't that something? We have that privilege. I think we really fussed when we, prayer was took out of schools. But I think in order for it to, that to have happened, it was first become insignificant in our homes. We wasn't praying as we ought to. So we can't blame anybody but ourselves. Uh, but prayer is a real deal. That's part of it. But we need to talk about that. Our children need to understand. We, we talked Wednesday night. I shared a little bit about our missionary over in Laos. I mean, the first three months he was there, he couldn't preach. They, they don't allow you to preach. You preach. You do like what we're doing here. You go to jail. I mean, and you know, he's a, he's a missionary. What do you do as a missionary? You know, when you're out there trying to win souls for Christ, people have sent you to a foreign land, and, uh, and you've got to win people to Jesus and you can't preach. What do you do? Well, what he did, he just invited people over to his house to eat with him, and he just prayed over his meal. For three months, he just prayed over his meal. Never preached one message, just prayed over his meal. And, and, and he just was a friend to those people that came into his house. And one day, a young girl stood up. I shared this for you that was here Wednesday night, but I think the rest of you need to hear it. He said, a young girl stood up and says, what do I need to do to be a Christian? Now, isn't that amazing? How that just by being who you are and realizing the significance of that, that somebody, and it might just be your child, that will stand up one day and ask you, Mama, what do I need to do to be a Christian? Now, if they don't see it in you, they're not going to ask that question. But if they can see it in you, and we've had the proper influence that we all want to have, then one day, all of our desire is to hear that question asked, What can I do? What do I need to do to be a Christian? It's a wonderful thing to have this privilege, but sometimes we have to mind ourselves of that truth because it's you and I that have the privilege, if you're a mother and a father, to shape the next generation. One of the greatest mission fields in the world is in our own homes. Isn't that something? You don't have to get a visa, passport, or buy an airplane ticket. You can just start it off right there in our own homes. And I think this is kind of one of the things that was going on. I know things are not perfect. I realize that. I mean, sometimes, you know, we, uh, we parents are square off with each other. But can I tell you something? Keep your voices down. When you're discussing things, help your children to know that you're not mad with each other. You just have a difference of opinion. And when you get away from that, they'll learn how to do it, see, later on. But if that's all they say you do, when they get grown, you know what they're going to do? Same thing. They're going to holler at each other and raise their voices, and kids are going to feel bad. And they may never ask, what can I do to become a Christian? Well, Brother Joey thought she was a spy that the government sent in. So him and his wife had to take her off into another room and kind of ask her a few more questions. But it was genuine. She said, I, I, he asked her how she knew, uh, or why did she think they were a Christian? She said, well, I've read about it. I've read about it. She's read books about what a Christian is. And what she saw was them being who they were. It was not insignificant. It was a real deal. Sometimes you mothers, you... Uh, especially if you spend a lot of time at home. In our, our culture today, mothers do everything. I'm, I'm kind of amazed, really, at how they keep it all together. You know, doing everything. A good majority of our mothers today is, is what the Bible calls a, uh, one of those mothers who do everything. You know, they work at home. They have a job, have a business and whatever, and still trying to juggle, you know, being a parent amongst all of that. It's pretty difficult in our culture today to try to be a mother and have the influence that we ought to have. But, but God can help us to do it. But sometime in the midst of all of that, you kind of feel like you're isolated, you know, from other people, and you're just right there around the house. I, I know uh, my wife uh, grew up as a homemaker and, 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 you know, looking after children. 
I mean, she worked for a while, and then after a couple come along, she figured, you know, ain't no use of work. It's going to pay more. I got to pay out more than it's going to take. <laughs> I can make out there. But she chose to stay home and do other things. Eventually, she started driving a bus when all the kids got big enough to go. And she, she didn't drive a bus because that was the only thing she could do. She drove a bus because that's what uh, she's going to take her kids to school on that bus. And she is going to be the one that drove it, and she did. She learned how to drive with one of them old floor shift pickup trucks. When I was dating her, she'd drive that thing good as I could. But, but that, that's kind of what it was about. And even right now, and some of you run into that kind of thing. Uh, I'll come in. She's babysitting a couple of grandkids now. And I come in, and she just wants me to talk to her. How many of you men ever heard that? Your wife, you come in, and your wife just wants you to talk to her. And you ain't got a thing in the world what to say. <laughs> but she just wants you to talk, you know, because she wants an adult to talk to her, somebody that she can carry on an adult conversation with. But, but when, you, when you begin to feel isolated like that, uh, you just... You just have those kind of feelings there. And, and sometimes it's difficult. And sometimes you just want to get out and walk around and, and uh, walk around the house and hope the kids don't, uh, you know, climb up on a ladder or something and fall down. But nevertheless, there are those who too get so frustrated with the basic things of life that you just want to throw your hands up and just forget it all. It's tough, isn't it? I know some of you ladies out there, you're raising your kids. You, now, now, I'm not saying you did that, but sometimes we think things, that thought will come to their mind. What if I just left it all and let my husband figure out how it really is around here? You know what I'm saying? No. But there are people that do. But you know it could be worse. It could be a lot worse. In fact, there's a story I want to share with you. And uh, in the book of Ruth, things could be, be much more difficult. In Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malan and Chilion. They were Ephrodites, or Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Now, they were living in Bethlehem. Now, the title, or what Bethlehem means, is house of bread. Now, this is significant. They were leaving a place that, whose name meant house of bread, and there was a famine there. It was difficult. And so Elimelech, I don't know whose idea it was to leave, but him and his wife Naomi chose to leave and take their two sons and go into Moab and looking for a better life. Have you ever just thought you'd just go look for a better life? And when you got there, it didn't end up that way, but it just seemed like it. Sometimes grass seems always greener on the other side. When you get real frustrated with that husband and think, I wonder what would happen if I had me another husband, it probably wouldn't be no different. All men bow a lot. I, I just about a lot. I, I, I realize there's exceptions to that. Hey, some of you guys, it's real special. And some of you ladies say amen. Boy, I'm right on target, ain't I? I? I think I am right here today. Yes. No, us, us men are better. Like, I think we can do better if we were to really try. And, and you probably, probably think so too. Now, I don't know if it was his idea or hers, but they ended up in a country, uh, another, another land whose name wasn't House of Bread. It was by the name of Moab. Things got tough. Sometimes things happen that way. Uh, Naomi's husband died and it wasn't long after that that both of the sons died and all she had left was her two daughters-in-law and she got word that there was bread again in 
Let me just read about it, if you will. In Ruth chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. So she purposed in her heart to return. And she said to her sisters-in-law, she had two sisters-in-law, and she said, I'm going back home. I want y'all to go back to your parents. Go back to your own families and to whatever God you serve. And she persuaded one of them to go back. But there was another one by the name of Ruth that says, no, I'm not going. And we hear this read sometime at weddings. This was not a wedding. This was just a, a situation that had come up. And Naomi was headed back, but Ruth said to her, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither you lodge, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more, if aught but death part thee and me. Now that's a real daughter-in-law, isn't it? You know, some of the greatest conflicts of life is between mothers and their daughter-in-laws. Folks, this is a real, real world we're living in. I'm not telling you nothing you don't know. This is a real deal. And I, and I know some of you love your mother-in-laws, and I know we have all kinds of excuses why we don't get along. We all do, and we've got our opinions. But I just want you to notice something about this, about Ruth. Now, there was something about Naomi that helped her to know that she was different. And so what I want us mothers to do is help our children and their in-laws to realize there's something different about us. Now, you won't convince them all, but, but Ruth got it. Whatever it was that she had, now she saw it in the midst of adversity. Things weren't good for Naomi, ladies and gentlemen. Her name was called Pleasant. But she was dealing with some tough things. The death of her husband and both of her sons and in a foreign land. There's no details as to what she did, what she said, or how she dealt with it. But there was something about it that touched the heart of Ruth. So you're not insignificant. Things are not always pleasant. Sometimes things are difficult. But in the midst of all of that, we have an opportunity to influence people around us. It's, it's a real deal. Matter of fact, when Naomi got back, to her homeland in uh, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. They called her, is not this Naomi? And her name meant pleasant. And this is what she said back to him. Call me not Naomi, but call me Mara, Mara, which means bitter. She had gone through some tough things, but even in the midst of the bitterness that may have been in her heart. She influenced Ruth to follow her, even though she asked her not to. She says, For the Almighty hath been very hath dealt very bitterly with me. He said, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord that's testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted? I mean, she just, you know, there's a scripture in the Bible sometimes we don't like to refer to it when th things are bad. But it's Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. That's difficult sometimes to swallow during tough times. And sometimes we may even get bitter about it those unpleasant moments. 
and when we suffer loss. But in the midst of all of that, she told him to call her that, but you know what, ladies and gentlemen, it didn't stick because that's not who she was. Sometimes we have a tendency to say things kind of out of context. I believe that happened to Thomas when he, when he wasn't present, when Jesus showed up. I believe Thomas had faith, even though what he said was real and it's recorded in the Bible. He said, I won't believe lest I see. It's hard for me to imagine somebody that followed Christ three years and had the confidence of those brethren that was around him to tell you all that, and he just wanted to see. That's all. The disappointment was in his heart. And sometimes we have a tendency to say things we don't really mean because that's not really who we are. And so what we need to do in the midst of our discouragement and difficulty, we just need to remember, that's not who I am. We need to remember who we are. You remember the old prodigal? This is kind of a story like that, but it has a little different slant to it. You remember that old prodigal son that had left home? He left full, he had his pockets full of money, and, and he went out, had a big time. When he got out there, you know what happened to him? He came to himself. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, especially you mothers that have such a heavy load in our culture today, sometimes you just have to remember who you are. If you are a child of faith, you've got to remember that. You say, I can't, I can't be like the world. I've got to be different. I'm touched. My heart's heavy. It's tough. It's hard. I don't know why God's allowed me to go through this. But you just got to remember, there's a higher purpose. You got to remember who you are. When that prodigal's son came to himself, you know what he did? He remembered his father, who his father was. I remember my father. I'm going home. And so he went. He was going to make a deal with him, but I mean, he knows God the Father don't make deals. He don't make deals. He's just full of love. That he wants to receive all those who will come to him. He said, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So in the midst of all your discouragement, if you can just remember, ladies, who you are. Just remember that we have someone we can go to. We don't have to go it alone. She eventually took her mind off herself and put it on that young girl that was following her around. One of the best ways in the world to overcome discouragement and disappointment is just take your mind off of yourself and just put it on those people that are following you around. They're different ages, but they're following you around. And that's what she did. She, she, she put her, her focus on Ruth, that young daughter-in-law. They just wouldn't let go. They just kept following her around. And if you can do that, you'll succeed. Selfish people just never succeed. But if you can get your mind off of your troubles and, and put them on more significant things, then you'll remember what your purpose is. Well, it's a real deal. It's a higher calling. In Ruth chapter 2 and verse 1, Naomi mentioned about a kinsman of her husband's. He was a mighty man of wealth and of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Now, going back to the prodigal, this has got a little different slant, but he knew his father was a man of wealth. Now, you and I know that our father owns the cattle of a thousand hills. He's not broke. He's not discouraged, and, and he's real. And he'll take us in. But what Naomi remembered was that she had a kinsman redeemer. Even though she lost her husband, she lost her two sons, but God in His sovereign purpose provided for people back in that day a, some directions about what to do and how to go about being redeemed that your children could, uh, their daughters could raise up children and, and all so... So what she did, she began to instruct Ruth about what to do to be a part of this. Boaz wasn't even the first in line. But 
Now, they went through the process. Sometimes we go through the process. We'll try it another way, and it won't work. But, but it works. God's Word always works. And so, so Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, ended up, long, making a long story short, marrying Ruth and having a child. Now, Naomi, taking her mind off herself, because she was a part of that kinsman redeemer benefit, but Ruth was the one that ended up marrying Boaz. But Boaz took care of both of them, married one of them, and had a child. And what's neat about this story is that uh, Ruth's son, and I'll go to the scripture here. I won't go to the scripture. I'm just going to tell it to you. Her son was named Obed. You know who Obed was the father of? Jesse. You know who Jesse was the father of? David. And if you'll follow that lineage, what we see here is a Gentile girl being redeemed by a kinsman redeemer and becoming in the lineage of Christ. Isn't that a powerful story? Sometimes things, are, things seem tough, seem impossible, but God has a plan to fulfill His eternal purpose in our lives. If we just won't give up, throw in the towel, and realize, you know, that we too have a kinsman redeemer. We have a redeemer. His name is Jesus. And He's the one that can help us, and He'll make a way for us. With all the troubles, and sometimes when you feel insignificant, He'll make you feel special. When you feel alone, he says, I'll be with you always, even unto the end. And when you feel discouraged, he'll lift you up. And he'll help you to know that this is real. You don't have to go it alone. But what we have to do is remember who we are. If we're a person of faith, if you're a lady out there, a mother or a mother-to-be, you can be a person of faith and be blessed of God. And when that faith is being tried, just remember who you are and remember who to go to and trust God. He'll see you through. He'll see you through every time. I'd like to take a moment in closing to have a word of prayer with you. I'd like for you to just bow your heads with me for a moment. Now, whether you are a mother or whether you're a father or son or daughter, we do have a Redeemer. His name is Jesus. He'll be no different to you if you're a daughter or if you're a son or if you're a mother or if you're a father, he's going to treat you the same. But he loves you enough to redeem you. And he's got a plan of redemption. And if you don't know what that is, there's plenty of people here to be glad to share it with you. But if you do and you say, Brother Bell, yes, I've had a lot of things to bring discouragement to me, a lot of disappointments in life. I even got to the place I wasn't even sure if it was real. But I believe what you're talking about today, Brother Bell. I believe it's true. And I want to I want to find him again. I want to remember. I want to trust him with my soul and my life. If that's you and you'd like to just walk forward and say, yes, it's, it's me. Today's my day. God wants to change my life today. I believe God wants to change my life. I need God to touch me today and set me free. If y'all give you just a moment, I'm not going to hold you long, but if you're here and that's you, come on forward. Let's pray about it. Let's believe God together. And you too will be a person of faith. You may not know a soul in your family that you believe is really following God. You know what? God would like for you to be that person. If you're willing to step up and give it all to Him. Anybody here? Oh, I'm going to change the order of the service. So I want you to think about it. I especially want to pray for all you mothers. But, but if you're here and you say, Brother Bill, I, I can relate to what you're talking about. Sometimes it seems like I just have to do the most important things in my house by myself. Nobody looking around. Matter of fact, I ain't even going to ask you to lift your hands because 
your husband's liable to see you and liable to feel bad at you and you'll have a squabble before you get home. We don't want that. But I want you to just think about it. I want to say a prayer for you. I know it's tough. It's difficult. But I want you to know that God cares about you. And if you'll trust Him, if you'll trust Him, God will see you through. And God will help you. You may have had a tough time. Some people said a lot tougher than others. But God will be with you either way. So I want to say a prayer for you. That God would give you encouragement. And He would increase your faith. And you'll realize how important the task at home is in raising up children. So let's do it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for those who have availed themselves to the ministry of the Word of God and to prayer and to your presence and power of the Holy Spirit to encourage, strengthen, and help us out of all of our troubles. There's probably not many in here, Lord, that at some point in time in their life just really can remember going through a heavy struggle. But Lord, you're the one that helps through them all. You said there are many afflictions to the righteous, but that you would deliver us out of them all. So our hope, Lord, is in you. In the midst of all of these tough times, just help us to remember who we are if we're followers of Christ that we can always have hope and we can have joy. And we can once again realize how important it is that the mission that's right at our door, we can fulfill it in honoring you and win their confidence that maybe one day when that little one gets old enough, they'll ask, what can I do? Or what do I need to do to be a Christian? And we'll have an answer for them. God, I want to thank you for your presence today. Lord, may these words abide in our hearts. And I pray for these mothers, Lord, in the midst of all that they try to do and have to do and juggling their schedules. And some of them are just full-time homemakers and help them, God, in the midst of that isolation to realize, Lord, how precious and important it is. And for those, Lord, that maybe feel like they're carrying two or three jobs, that they'll be able also, God, to just take the time in the midst of all their busyness, God, just to be a light to those in the house. God, I want to thank you for it and give you all the glory. In Jesus' glorious name, amen.